I'm also very happy we're having this conversation uh, today. First, uh, to to start by a, by a, a, a clear statement uh, from from my side, is that we see uh, a lot of conversation uh, around uh, the difference between a human rights and protection. And uh, I would like to start by saying that we don't see uh, that difference. We think and we believe and we're sure in practice that at the end, reaching the human rights of people uh, is fulfilling their protection. Uh, and as such, we see that the tools might be complementary coming from a humanitarian or a human rights or a development or a peace perspective. But at the end, it's all heading and founded uh, on the main concept of uh, of human rights. Now, I would like to share three um, uh, observations, three field observations uh, uh, regarding this issue. The first one is a question of mindset. Having a human rights approach in delivering humanitarian aid makes us shift from a charity mindset of helping people to a real true humanitarian solution oriented protection oriented rights based mindset of aid and that's extremely important it's extremely important for our behaviors as staff on the ground among the community it's very important in the language we use it's also very important in, in the way we program and design what needs to happen. This shift from charity to true protective humanitarian action has to pass through a human rights approach. The second element that is very helpful for a deep human rights understanding in the field is that it forces us to go deeper and understanding the situation on the ground and what people are facing. What a human rights approach makes us do is to look not only about at the food on the table, but it makes us look at what's actually happening under the table. Is a girl married off and the family has received payment? This is how we have food on the table. Has a child dropped out of school and is working in horrible conditions? And this is how we have food on the table. And this a human rights approach allows us to understand deeper, not only the tip of the iceberg, but also the whole bottom. And as such, we can address issues in a more sustainable and more real and more effective way. And that leads me to the third point. Local actors, local actors, local actors. Having a sustainable engagement on human rights issues requires cultural understanding, long term legal engagement, parliamentary engagement, cultural change and shift, broad true alliance in the leadership of the community, but across all the layers of communities. And the only real actors that can sustain this long-term patience and have the true built-in skills to drive a human rights agenda on the ground are the local actors. And this is where we have as humanitarians to make much more efforts in liaising with legal firms, parliamentarians, human rights commissions in our work because the only true lifeline of whatever we start or try to do will only be achieved and completed by local actors. And part of the challenge to that is that in many cases, the main people that would require support to achieve their human rights don't even have the chance to raise their hands and tell us that they are in trouble. We have to be there with 
long-term trust in the communities to observe when there is trouble and be able to work on it. And the loudest successes in addressing human rights issues are often proven by their invisibility. They're silent, they happen behind closed doors. And even when we succeed in meeting the rights of a community or a person, these people won't even celebrate that because they slide back into normality in silence. And that silence that is a success is a major obstacle for financing and resourcing and resource mobilization. And this is where we need a continuous mind shift among uh, the donor ecosystem that we work with to invest in this long-term, silent, consistent, persistent work on no regret basis, because it's right and it achieves, even though it won't probably be shown in glossy reports or on cameras.